Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to introduce Fabian Isensee. He is working at the German Cancer Research Center and he is working on medical image segmentation. In a recent paper, he introduced a method called NNUNet and this builds upon UNet and suggests several strategies how to quickly make it feasible onto new segmentation tasks in domains where only limited training data is available. So he kind of has a auto ML strategy to make the method applicable to new tasks. The paper was published in Nature Methods and the interesting side story is when he first submitted this paper to Mikai, it actually was rejected because he is essentially using UNIT and demonstrates that he can outperform many modifications of UNIT just by setting up the training setup correctly and choosing the parameters right. And the reason for rejection was actually that it's not new. So I'm very happy that his paper is now accepted in such a prestigious journal such as Nature Methods. Also, Fabian now graduated from his PhD. He is now running a junior research group in the German Center for Cancer Research. And by now he has won numerous medical image segmentation challenges. And he also won the award of the German Conference on Medical Image Processing for his achievements. So it's a great pleasure to introduce him here. And his presentation today will be entitled NNUNet, a self-configuring method for deep learning based biomedical image segmentation. And without further ado, I can only say, Fabian, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Andreas, for uh, for the introduction and also for uh, inviting me to present this work uh, in front of your uh, in front of your PhD students and your lab. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, again. Thank you so much, um, also for this for your warm words. Um, so I'd like to talk about NNUNet today. Um, this was, uh, as Andreas mentioned, a relatively recent Nature Methods publication. But um, if you've been uh, doing semantic segmentation in the past years, you may already have stumbled upon preliminary releases of it. Uh, we started working on it in 2018 and uh, finally got it uh, into a uh, proper journal publication um, in late 2020 was, was the acceptance. Um, so yeah, and then UNET is a method for semantic segmentation. So what is semantic segmentation? I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this type of image analysis problem. In semantic segmentation, we are interested in classifying each individual uh, pixel of an image into one of uh, several predefined classes. Um, this kind of um, image analysis problem is very common. It's used in uh, natural image processing in biological image analysis, and of course also in medical image analysis, which is uh, what my personal background is. Um, as a side note, I should mention that NNUNet um, is not necessarily restricted to the use in medical images, but because it was developed uh, in the medical image analysis area, all the, all of the, most of the examples you will be seeing throughout this talk are from the medical domain. So um, semantic segmentation, especially in the biomedical domain, is uh, one of the problems that is um, among like among those problems that are most often uh, addressed in the literature and also in competitions and this kind of highlights how many people are actually working on on solutions to this problem so if we are looking uh, into a survey of um, competitions in the biomedical domain we can actually see that 70 percent of competitions uh, in this particular survey that i'm citing down here um, were uh, dealing with segmentation problems and this kind of highlights the popularity of of these kinds of things um, naturally, um, being a uh, part of a group that does uh, natural um, that does medical image analysis, we also have been working on multiple segmentation approaches in the past with multiple different uh, data sets, and <clears throat> we've been coming up with all kinds of different uh, unit-inspired architectures uh, to solve all these uh, all these problems. But in an ideal world. 
um, what we would like to have is um, given some annotated training data set, um, some button that we can just press uh, and then we press the button. And what happens is that we magically obtain a fully trained, fully configured uh, unit pipeline that can then be applied to segment previously unseen images at state of the art quality. Unfortunately, the real world is a little bit different than that. And um, what is uh, essentially the current quote unquote state of the art in semantic segmentation in not just the biomedical domain, but in many other domains as well, is that we are given some training data set and then we have some poor PhD student, intern, postdoc, whoever uh, that does uh, manual configuration of a segmentation method. And uh, the way this works is that this person needs to think about all the different parts of the pipeline. Um, for example, pre-processing, resampling, target spacing, what kind of network architecture they would like to use, um, what kind of network topology is, is appropriate. This goes together with lots of different hyperparameters, loss functions, anything of this can be very specific for each data set. They need to come up with something uh, that does the network training and all the hyperparameters associated with that, maybe some post-processing and ensembling. And once they have uh, an entire pipeline and, and trained it and evaluated it on some validation set, the question is, is this good enough? Is the performance satisfying? Do I need to continue um, updating my method or can I then just deploy it? And um, most of the time, um, the performance is not going to be very good out of the gate. So you need to do um, a lot of optimizations in your pipeline, meaning you need to go back to all these different aspects, change them, adapt them, research the literature for other things you can try, try them out, uh, rerun your experiments, rerun your validation, maybe improve in performance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the complicated part here is that all of these things, these things are interconnected. Um, you cannot really change one without maybe having to change the other. So it's a, a very high dimensional optimization problem that is very difficult to tackle and that can also get uh, computationally expensive quite quickly. Um, but once you've gone through this, a couple of maybe tens, hundreds iterations uh, and network trainings, uh, you maybe find something that you deem good enough and you say, okay, this is ready for deployment and then you can apply it to your test data or apply it in a clinic or wherever you would like to deploy your model. The problem of this process is uh, that it's entirely um, based on manual interaction with the method and manual configuration of the method. And this process is extremely time consuming and also not very rewarding because that is something that's, uh, unless you win a competition with it, it's very difficult to um, publish as a research paper because these, all these tiny minute changes that you have probably been doing for over a year or so is just something where a reviewer will say, there's no novelty behind this. Um, how it's successful and how good your uh, method will end up being um, very much depends on how experienced you are. Um, that is, so if you have multiple years of experience, you know what knobs you need to turn uh, to improve performance given the current state. But if you're inexperienced, then uh, it will take you a lot of trial and error or you will not achieve uh, state-of-the-art performance with, with this process. And because it requires a lot of um, expertise in building deep learning pipelines, um, this process is inaccessible to, to non-experts, meaning that somebody who has a nice data set but doesn't know anything about deep learning needs to get a data scientist uh, in order to get a segmentation method for their data set. Um, where this problem kind of gets amplified is when you look at... Um, the landscape of data sets in the, here this is from the biomedical domain. And what we are try, trying to highlight with this uh, figure is the diversity that um, you can encounter uh, in, in our domain. So when you think about um, what kind of imaging modalities do we encounter, what kind of voxel spacings, so physical size each voxel represents, do we encounter what kind of data anisotropy, data sizes, class imbalances, et cetera, do we have? And we put this all together and then we see that there's an extremely diverse landscape of data sets, which is um, indicative of just how things are in the medical domain. But this also poses problems when you think about it from a data science perspective, because any method that you will be building for one of these particular data sets will need to account for these properties and in turn, um, make that this very method will, without any adaptations, uh, likely not work very well on a different data set that has different properties. So for example, if you think of um, 
cardiac cine MRI data sets, which are very anisotropic, have very few um, axial slices with a thick slice thickness. If you build something specifically for that and then try to apply it to a, to a liver CT um, segmentation problem, then it's unlikely that you will be achieving state-of-the-art performance with this. So um, the process that I described, described two slides earlier, or one slide earlier, um, essentially is something that cannot just be transferred between data sets, but whenever you are confronted with a new data set, the process must be repeated. And <clears throat> this makes it especially frustrating in the biomedical domain where we have such a large data set diversity that essentially whenever we have a new data set, it's uh, quite likely that there's no method that can directly be applied to it and get the performance that we want. Um, this kind of observation also has potential implications for the publication landscape uh, in which we are operating. Um, if you are working with medical image analysis, uh, there's a 100% chance that you have heard about the UNET. It's uh, by far the most popular uh, style of network architecture for tackling uh, segmentation problems. Um, this is also reflected in how many citations the, uh, the UNET has. That's uh, Last time I checked, it was around 25,000, which is uh, a crazy high number. And it's, just, uh, it's also totally deserved. This architecture has just proven the test of time over and over again. Um, but naturally, in, in science, people try to improve things. And as such, many people have tried to improve upon the standard UNET by introducing all kinds of modifications to it, which by itself is a, is a fantastic thing. It's great to see people picking up on something and trying to improve it. But um, where it's sometimes this, these improvements fall short is in, in their evaluation. Um, so if you think about how you want to evaluate a new method that has a general methodological claim, such as a unit with residual connections outperforms a unit, then you're saying in this method is in general or on average, better than the standard unit. And in order to claim this kind of, uh, in, in order to prove this kind of claim, ideally what you, what you should do is evaluate this claim on many different data sets. Um, you need to, um, for each of these data sets, go through this manual process that I outlined earlier to find a very well-tuned uh, configuration. But uh, what you also need to do, and this is a hard requirement, is you need to uh, do the same manual optimization process for the baseline algorithm as well. So you're not supposed to just um, optimize your um, methodological variation on the target data set and then pick some baseline that you somewhere downloaded from GitHub and, and apply it. And uh, of course, you will also perform this baseline, but you should uh, really spend just as much time tuning the baseline as you are uh, tuning your methods. And if we take into account everything I've said before, um, these uh, last two points uh, are really problematic because um, there is so much effort involved in optimizing methods for specific data sets and also um, baseline methods such as the UNET will essentially never have been developed for or trained on uh, the same data sets that you're trying to develop your method for. I mean, often you are working in a collaboration with a specific clinician on a specific segmentation problem and you will be using that data set. And then um, unless you're taking enough, um, enough care to also optimize your baseline method for this data set, you could end up with something that uh, doesn't perform as well as it should. Uh, to give you a little bit of a uh, data-driven uh, data insight on, onto this, um, what we have done is analyze the leaderboard um, of the kidney and kidney tumor segmentation challenge 2019. This was the largest competition at MICHAI uh, in this year with over 100 participants. And what was really nice about it is that every um, person, like on the leaderboard, you can click on a link and it will directly send you to the paper of the person describing their approach. So um, you can uh, an like analyze all these papers, see what they have done and see where they ended up in the leaderboard and try to derive some useful information from there. So, and this is exactly what we have done. So what, what you're seeing here at the top is um, the score of uh, the kids leaderboard. And then uh, along this row is the ranking of, e uh, the ranking of each team um, with the highest ranking team at the very left. And what we've done here is from all these publications that we found, uh, extracted those that use a 3D unit like uh, network architecture, meaning anything that is encoder decoder with skips. Uh, so residual, dense, with attention, without attention, plain unit, everything. And what we're seeing here is, is a relatively strong signal showing us that um, using a 3D unit like network architecture is indicative of performing well on the kids task. This is something that 
um, is expected and kind of our uh, uh, proof of concept just to show um, Hey, 3D unit works really well. But if we are now looking, trying to, to use the 3D unit contributions and stratify them into all these different modifications that have been proposed recently, what we would expect to be seeing based on the results in the respective papers is that it, some, some signal at least that maybe the residual unit on average performs a little better than the standard unit or that a unit with attention gates performs better than the standard unit. But if we conduct this very same analysis for these different subtypes of the unit, <clears throat> it becomes very difficult to see a clear signal. So what the blue, the blue bars here are essentially just unmodified 3D units and um, the other ones are like the residual unit, which is actually um, the type of architecture that won the competition. Then we have some dense units, uh, units with dilated convolutions instead of poolings, some attention units, and also uh, um, you for can forget about the last row. That's uh, just to demonstrate who, which teams used a cascaded approach and which uh, which teams didn't. But in in general. Um, what we would expect to see here again would be that any of these uh, modifications should have some kind of signal indicating that the claim that was made in the original paper that they outperformed a standard unit holds true. And unfortunately, this is not the case. It's very difficult to draw conclusions from this leaderboard. And, and we believe that this uh, one of the underlying reasons behind this is that um, potentially um, a lot of the claims that are being made in the literature do not transfer well to new data sets because the evaluation was not being done uh, thoroughly enough. So the implications of this whole manual method, need for manual method configuration um, are for the literature landscape, landscape is that it uh, reduces the thoroughness of um, method evaluation um, because many authors are not willing to go through this process for many data sets and thus will run evaluation on just uh, a couple of data sets in practice, and also that the optimization of the baseline is often not done well enough, uh, which causes um, papers to report uh, fantastic results compared to the unit, but uh, the baseline they're comparing with is just not um, well, well enough configured and not performing as well as it could. Um, and then UNET is essentially our proposed solution for all of these problems. Uh, when you try to, uh, when you, um, when you make us describe an unit in one sentence, what we would say is that it's an uh, out-of-the-box tool that automatically configures entire segmentation pipelines for any data sets in the biomedical domain, and it does that without requiring any expert knowledge or uh, relying on extensive compute resources to run. Um, to understand why we did, why we uh, implemented an unit the way we did. It's important to first highlight what our design goals are and um, why these design goals are maybe not, uh, can maybe not be fulfilled by existing uh, methods in the literature. So design goals for an unit are that it should just work out of the box, no, ex no expert knowledge required. So essentially the press of a button in the ideal world scenario, uh, it should be using standard deep learning hardware so that any person uh, with, say, an RTX 2080 Ti GPU or better can run it without, um, without having to wait months for it to complete. Um, it needs to be designed for the problems it's, uh, it's uh, supposed to tackle. So biomedical data sets uh, um, a particular focus on 3D, but you can, of course, also apply it to 2D data. And uh, we often have relatively few training cases. And one important aspect, what it needs to be is holistic, meaning we want an entire pipeline and not just one specific part of the pipeline. For example, the network architecture, what we really want is everything from start to finish. Um, so if you look in the literature, um, this kind of automation approach is usually um, uh, addressed by something that's called AutoML, Automated Machine Learning. Um, which delivers, uh, there's no denying it, outstanding performance in, in natural image processing. But so far, uh, it hasn't been very successful uh, or consistently successful in the biomedical domain. Um, that is, I believe, uh, in part because it relies on relatively large data set sizes in order to um, make its empirical optimization process uh, work and, and, and not overfit too much. And it also relies on... Um, lots of compute resources, which is also something not many groups in the medical image, uh, medical or biomedical domain have. So for example, you will see AutoML based uh, papers from Google, et cetera, who just have uh, uh, orders of magnitude more compute resources than 
uh, probably all of us combined. Um, AutoML approaches are also not something that you can just use as a non-expert because often you need to define specific search spaces. You need to know about your method. You need to know about uh, certain restrictions you want to do to the search space so that your um, search becomes tractable. And many AutoML approaches, especially those that tackle complicated problems, are not holistic, meaning that they're very good at optimizing specific things. For example, uh, auto-augment for, um, for data augmentation, neural architecture search for um, for the network architecture, but uh, really something that takes a data set and gives you a method and everything in between needs to be configured automatically. That's something that's until now just, just not possible. Um, so it's important uh, to keep these design goals in mind, what we are trying to achieve, because uh, honestly speaking, and a new net is not um, providing groundbreaking new automation methods but what it but what it does is it's enormously um, pragmatic it's uh, solution driven and uh, and it works and these are kind of the selling points uh, i like to use when when talking about nn unit so how does nn unit work um yeah so um i forgot about this part sorry <laughs> so um, clearly, the uh, AutoML route for what we are trying to achieve here is, is not the right tool for the job. That's not saying AutoML is, the, is, is problematic. It's not. It's a fantastic tool. It's just not what we need here. And <clears throat> the way we will be building an NUNet or we have been building an NUNet is to shortcut the empirical optimization, which uh, causes a lot of the issues we are seeing with AutoML in this particular setting. So shortcut uh, shortcut empirical optimization through inductive biases, meaning that we will be trying to, to in, infuse as much expert knowledge into NN unit as possible to make all these design choices in, uh, in a very computationally cheap way. So in a new net, uh, in order to achieve this, we have uh, conceived a uh, what we call three-step recipe, uh, which is essentially the identification of fixed parameters, rule-based parameters, and empirical parameters. And all aspects of the segmentation pipeline can be attributed to one of these three and set according to um, however we are going to set these categories. I will be saying more about that in the following slides. Um, it's important to note that we have developed an NUNet using the 10 data sets provided by this uh, medical segmentation decathlon. So all the decisions we made, all the parameters we set, this was all thoroughly validated by running experiments on these 10 data sets and ensuring that whatever we've been doing uh, generalizes, uh, generalizes well. So the fixed parameters are uh, a collection of design decisions that uh, we do not need to change when we're moving from one data set to another. Um, this at first glance sounds uh, trivial and uh, it, it might be, but finding a collection of hyperparameters that is robust enough to be just set out of the box, uh, like set and forget, is something that's not trivial because you need to, um, again, there's lots of inter interdependencies here and you need to, to find something that does not only work very well, but it does so consistently. And finding this kind of subset is, again, was subject um, to uh, extensive experimentation on the medical segmentation decathlon data sets. Um, part of the fixed parameters are things like um, what learning rate and learning rate schedule we are using, um, the loss function. Uh, we have found, for example, that just a simple sum between dice and cross entropy loss has a lot of uh, desired properties and works uh, really well, especially if you combine it with uh, a mild oversampling, which is uh, something we're also doing and it's not mentioned here, it should be mentioned here. Um, the architecture template that we are using is always the same. What we mean by that is that um, we are just using a unit, a standard unit-like architecture. So that's a encoder-decoder architecture with skip connections and plain convolutions. Uh, this is also where uh, the name NN unit comes from. NN unit is a uh, kind of uh, abbreviation for no new net, um, with which we want to emphasize that. Uh, very strong segmentation performance can be achieved with standard uh, unit-like architectures, and there's no need for fancy architecture modifications uh, in the biomedical domain, at least. Um, other fixed parameters are things like optimizer data augmentation and, and what our training and inference procedure looks like. So then the, I would say, more interesting part of NNUNet are what we call rule-based parameters. And here, our goal is to, to distill domain knowledge. So from essentially me participating in many different segmentation competitions, working with many different segmentation data sets, all this kind of domain knowledge and experience that, that I gathered 
um, working on those, distill that into a, a set of heuristic rules that uh, connect specific properties of the data sets, which we call the data set fingerprint, with desired properties in the segmentation pipeline. Uh, to give you an example, um, so this is what, what this looks like in NNUNet. So we, uh, given some uh, training data set, we will be um, uh, collecting some relatively simple information based on it. This is uh, what I mentioned before. So anisotropy, spacings, uh, intensities, modalities, etc. And based on this information, we will execute a set of uh, intricate uh, heuristic rules that will set a lot of different things in the segmentation pipeline, most notably, and I think this is one of the more interesting parts, uh, it will decide what network topology, so what kind of instantiation of the 3D unit template that I mentioned earlier we would like to use, uh, and what uh, batch size and patch size uh, we should use to train it, of course, given some GPU uh, memory limit. So the way this looks like is that we have a certain domain knowledge and, and constraints in place. So we know that in general, we like larger batch sizes because it gives us a better gradient estimate and therefore should um, uh, improve convergence up to some sweet spot, which we typically don't reach in our domain due to GPU memory constraints. But at the same time, we also know that we want a larger patch size because larger patch sizes allow the network to capture more contextual information, which in turn is important for it to be able to make decisions. So imagine you're standing like five centimeters in front of a wall. You wouldn't be able to say, hey, this is a house, this is a, a gym, this is just a wall because you're just too close to it. And it's the same with networks. They need to see enough context to make a decision. Um, so if you have some patch size, but then of course you also need a network topology that can make use of the patch size, meaning the receptor field of the network needs to be adapted to the patch size so that it can see everything that's contained in it. Um, so we want a large patch size, we want a large patch size, uh, so, good, uh, so far so good, but the problem is um, we have uh, some GPU memory limitation in place uh, in NNUnet. This is, uh, I, I always say it's 11 gigabytes, but in reality, I'm more setting like eight to nine to ensure that it's always running. Uh, so we have some GPU memory limitation in place, and this restricts us from taking both. Uh, so based on, on our experience, we know that we want to prioritize patch, large patch sizes over batch sizes, um, but at least guarantee a batch size of two. This is essentially one of the rules in NNUnet. And the way this is then implemented is that we have some some code that runs uh, iterative simple optimization of the, these three things that need to be optimized uh, jointly. So we start with some very large initial patch size that's usually the size or the typical size of an image in the data set. So we want to process an entire image. We configure the architecture topology such that it has uh, the depth and the pooling operations, et cetera, to, to make use of this patch size. We ask, hey, does this fit into my GPU memory with at least a batch size of two? And if the answer is yes, then we maybe have some additional head, um, headroom to even in increase the batch size further, which we will do up to some point and then we are done. But most often, of the t um, most often the answer is going to be, no, this definitely doesn't fit your GPU size. So we need to reduce the patch size because we've reduced the patch size. We need to redo the architecture configuration again ask the question, hey, does it fit now? And we run through this loop as often as, it, as we need in order to finally get a yes. And uh, since uh, we ran through this loop, we most likely don't have any uh, GPU memory headroom available, so the batch size will remain at two and we are done. So this is uh, an example of uh, rule-based parameters in NNUnit. Um, finally, and this is the part uh, we have been trying to reduce as much as possible is empirical optimization. Uh, there's certainly more we could do uh, in the future, but right now things are as they are. So we have actually been trying to build as much of the pipeline as possible with the fixed and the rule-based parameters and everything that we couldn't um, come up with rules for is what's happening at the end. And the only two empirical parameters that we're using in NNUnit is um, post-processing and model selection. So for post-processing, this is computationally relatively cheap because after we ran, uh, we ran uh, cross-validation on the training data, we have predictions for all training data sets and we can simply trial and error um, post-processing techniques. The only one that's currently implemented in NNUnet is uh, all but largest uh, connected component suppression. Um, and this is just, again, something we try out, we see if it improves things and if it improves things, then we use it and otherwise we just don't use it. Um, the second thing, and this is something we should definitely improve upon in the future, is that 
and then unit actually doesn't configure a single unit pipeline, but it configures three different unit pipelines. That's a 2D unit simply operating on 2D slices, a 3D unit uh, that operates on full image resolution, and then a cascade of two units, uh, two 3D units, where the first one operates on low resolution and the second one then refines the segmentations um, on, on the full resolution. And running these unit configurations in five-fold cross-validation each on the training data set can take some time. So that's something we, we need to improve in the future. And I'm confident that uh, that we can do it. But and then unit in, in its default setting, again, you can you can if you want mess with that and uh, not having to run all of those, but in its default setting, and then unit will run all those and then explore uh, combinations of max of as um, of uh, maximally two of them to use as ensemble, or it will uh, pick one of these configurations automatically depending on how it performs on the training data set. But this part here is, is really something where you can uh, also, uh, if you know a little bit about the data set you're applying in a new net tool, you can in theory also just pick one configuration and, and roll with it and you can save a lot of computation time. Um, if we plug everything together, um, this is uh, a broad, you could say, overview of NN unit. So again, we have the fixed parameters down here. We have um, the data fingerprint and the rule-based parameters here, empirical parameters up here, and then these different unit configurations that are um, that are being um, that are being generated by an unit. The good thing is, again, getting back to the ideal world scenario from the start is all of this is automated. Um, so if you if you really don't want to, you can just give an unit some training data, push a button, or in practice, enter a sequence of uh, commands in your terminal, but uh, no expert knowledge required, I promise. Um, you can like enter your data, push a button, and you get uh, a fully configured and fully trained segmentation pipeline that you can gen then deploy and, uh, and test. Um, so how well does it work? Uh, we have evaluated NN unit on 23 data sets from the biomedical uh, domain. All of these data sets originate from competitions. And I should mention that um, among those 23 data sets are also the 10 data sets of the medical segmentation decathlon. So we have the test sets of 10 data sets that we developed NN unit on plus 13 additional data sets that we haven't seen before at all uh, in the development of NN units. So these are then the, you could say, true test data sets. Um, but for the medical segmentation data sets, of decathlon data sets, those 10, of course, we don't, we don't have access to the test uh, uh, for the test segmentations we had to submit to the leaderboard just as anybody else. So um, even though we developed NN unit for it, the test set results are still something uh, that can be taken seriously. Um, so what you're seeing here essentially are qualitative results, segmentation maps generated by an unit for a bunch of different data sets. These are not all 23 because that would have been just too crowded. Um, but in each of these subplots, what you're seeing to the left is the raw image data with the generated segmentation maps by an unit as an overlay. All of these cases are taken from the respective test set of the data set. Uh, and to the right is just a 3D rendering of the very same uh, patient or data set to highlight the 3D nature of the segmentation problem. And what's really nice is that even though NN unit was just developed on um, MRI and uh, CT uh, modalities, uh, we are already seeing that NN unit quite nicely transfers to other imaging modalities as well. So for example, what we have here is um, scanning electron microscopy data. We have different types of MRI modalities that we haven't seen before, and we also have fluorescence microscopy data. Um, since all of these um, segmentation problems come from competitions, we can also, we, what we have naturally done is also submit to the test set and see how well uh, and then UNIT performs quantitatively um, against all the other methods on the respective leaderboard. I have highlighted the tasks associated with the uh, medical segmentation decathlon in blue here so that you know what data sets we used uh, to um, develop in a new net with. And what's cool to see here is that uh, even across the 13 additional data sets um, where we that we didn't see at all during development and a new net still consistently performed very nicely, even compared to uh, the other methods uh, on the respective leaderboard. And what was particularly nice is that NN unit was actually able to set a new state-of-the-art result in uh, 33 out of 53 uh, segmentation labels uh, or segmentation tasks, we call them, we tested, uh, we tested it on. 
And that is despite uh, an NUNet on all these 13 additional data sets competing against uh, specialized handcrafted solutions where some poor person went through the whole process I described at the beginning of the presentation to build a model that works really well. And it's just cool to see that something that is fully automated and hands off uh, is able to achieve this level of uh, performance without uh, the person applying it, essentially having to know anything about deep learning or unit based semantic segmentation. Um, one final aspect I'd like to highlight uh, of NNUNet that I would like to highlight uh, at the end, because I think it's interesting for this audience, is that uh, you can use NNUNet's dynamic nature as um, an experiment um, to, to run experiments on many different data sets. Um, this is essentially how we developed NNUNet, but it's, uh, I think, a very powerful tool for method development in the future. Because what you can do is you can, you can abuse, not, not abuse, but you can use NNUNet's dynamic um, configuration and, and the fact that it can mold itself to any given data set um, for a large scale evaluation of your own methods. So if you have, say, a, a new loss function or a new optimizer or a new data augmentation technique, you can drop this change simply into the NNUNet framework and let NNUNet do all the adaptation to those different data sets and then compare what you've been doing with uh, the NNUNet baseline to see if you, uh, if you um, were able to um, improve, uh, improve upon it. Um, so what we have here is the 10 data sets of the uh, medical segmentation decathlon. And just as a toy example, we have done some modifications to the standard NNUNet baseline such as adding um, residual connections to the encoder of the unit, maybe changing the momentum term of the optimizer, maybe using a different loss function, all these kinds of things. And we have applied it to the 10 data sets of the medical segmentation decathlon. And then we can, uh, using a um, rank then aggregate approach, we can get a global ranking over these 10 data sets. And there we see that, at least in this toy example, um, the NNUNet baseline was what perform, performed the best on average. Um, the important part here is that if, you, if you're just looking at one of these data sets in isolation, uh, all of these results are always going to be noisy because there's just a, a relatively um, small number of training cases in each of these data sets. So um, maybe if I reran the experiments on spleen, the result would look a little bit different. And if I was just looking at this data set, I would be drawing different conclusion, e conclusions each time. Um, and um, it, so it highlights that there's uh, some inherent noisiness, but maybe there is actually also a signal and that some uh, method variations really perform better on some specific data sets. And that would be then something that is interesting to have a closer look at if you're specifically interested in this data set and this specific segmentation problem. <clears throat> but if you're making a general methodological claim saying, hey, this is better than a standard unit, then what you ideally should do is use all these results from all these different data sets, aggregate them somehow and see what performs better on, on average. Um, cases where, um, the, so I was, as I was saying, sometimes maybe specific settings work better for a particular data set. And this is something you can, uh, you can exploit um, or, or try. So I should maybe approach this differently. So sometimes uh, you see that specific variations on a given data set work better than the standard uh, unit baseline. That is maybe because uh, there's noise, but again, maybe you have some signal there and something with this data set harmonizes better with something else you have been doing than the standard NN unit. And this is actually something that is uh, totally totally valid to do. And we, we are actually doing that all the time. So for example, if you think of segmentation competitions, one thing you can do is take whatever NN unit gives you as a starting point um, on that particular data set and then run um, manual optimization of your segmentation pipeline following the principles outlined uh, at the beginning of the presentation um, for this particular challenge. And because you have a very strong starting point and at the same time you ha essentially have a very strong baseline as well, you can be sure that whatever improvements you're doing on top of that is actually something that is going to be meaningful for this data set or this challenge. And um, we used this principle uh, last year to participate in three challenges. So uh, Peter and I uh, were able to take the first place in the MNMS competition. It's a MICI segmentation challenge on cardiac MRI. Uh, we were able to win the Brett's uh, challenge last year and also take the second place in the COVID-19 uh, lung, uh, lung CT segmentation challenge. And all of these approaches were essentially built on top of NNUNet. Uh, what's particularly nice for us to see <clears throat> is that um, 
not just we are taking in a new net and, and doing something with it, but actually other people in the community are picking it up and are being successful with it. So if you look at 2020, actually nine out of 10 segmentation competitions were won by people that took in a new net and, and built something on top of it. And that's just uh, like the perfect situation for us because we have built something that's benefiting other people. And that's, uh, to me at least, what, what research is all about. Um, so in summary, in a new net, um, <laughs> is uh, a little bit what the ideal world scenario is like. So you press a button, you get a segmentation methods. That's cool for domain experts because they don't need to, uh, to force some poor data scientists to work with their data set anymore. And they can ideally just apply it themselves. But it also has some cool features for uh, method researchers because it's a standardized baseline, because it has this dynamic nature, which also a little bit offers a new perspective on, on segmentation methods. Uh, and it is, has this, this framework that you can use to run large-scale evaluation. Of course, NNUNet is publicly available, so head over to our GitHub repository and, and try it out. And if you have any questions or problems, please just open an issue. I'm always there to help. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors. Um, uh, at, the, at the end, I'd like to thank my co-authors, most notably uh, Paul Yeager, um, who, with whom I share the first authorship on the Nature Methods paper. He has really been instrumental in, in getting that through. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's a fantastic person. And I'm happy that he also is now head of a young investigator group at uh, DKFZ. So yeah, um, nice picture of our department. Unfortunately, horrendously outdated. But uh, just also wanted to mention that it's fantastic to be working with all of these great people. And uh, it's a great, a great atmosphere there. So please uh, come visit us sometime. Yeah, so that's it from my part, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. So I have some applause for you. I hope you can hear it. I can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so the yeah, the audience isn't in the room, but uh, still we we have some applause and knocking on the table. It, the wonderful presentation, and also congratulations to the many achievements and the big successes that you had with the unit. I think this is really something that brought the field of medical image segmentation ahead and uh, i think it's just well deserved that you also win these competitions and i mean 90 percent of the segmentation winners of 2020 they were essentially based on your approach that that's really a marvelous result and what i also like a lot about the method it helps us adjusting the parameters that nobody likes to adjust like the patch <laughs> size and so on right <laughs> so yeah, so, though it's difficult to give hard guarantees that what NNUNet does is actually optimal, right? It's 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 giving you a good a good setting, but you can always try to improve. Yeah, and the the other thing is, it's also nice that you have essentially kept fixed the baseline configuration and kept it very close to the vanilla unit. And this, so from my intuition, and also if you look at the questions in the chat, one of the first questions that actually came up were, can I combine this now with ResNet and can I combine it with any attention unit and so on? So can you give us some insights or hints on that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is actually one of the more difficult things to change in, in a new net. Uh, we have done some work uh, in this regard with a residual unit, which is also up in our GitHub repository somewhere. So you can have a look at that. The reason this is a little bit difficult in an unit is that whatever res uh, architecture you're implementing needs to be uh, dynamic in its implementation. So it needs to be able to communicate with NNUNet A. So when NNUNet tells it, hey, I want five pooling operations and I want these kernel sizes for the pooling operations and these kernel sizes for the, for the convolutional kernel, your architecture implementation needs to accept that somehow. And another thing that, that is needed is that your architecture needs to uh, return an estimate of the memory consumption uh, that it's going to use. Um, so that is these two things are what is needed if you really want to uh, apply your architecture as dynamically as the standard unit implementation in NN unit. But um, what you can also do is for either for specific data sets, take the NN unit configuration and build your hard coded architecture for that, that accepts the exactly the things NN unit wants for that data set. Or you can also 
drop the memory estimation part, which can be, which is uh, also not very perfectly implemented. I must confess, you can drop this part, just implement a dynamic network architecture implementation, and then use it. And then an then unit might use more or less uh, memory depending on what the difference of your unit versus the standard unit is. But given that most people have like larger GPUs nowadays, and the standard and then unit just needs eight to nine gigabytes, I think this should this should work as well. Um, we are, by the way, I'm currently working on re-implementing the network architecture in NNU net because the implementation is a mess um, and uh, the change will come soon and it will hopefully make uh, things a little clearer as well. Very nice. Also great that you essentially can still configure custom losses and there's probably also segmentation tasks where you want to work with multitask segmentation or counting losses and stuff like that. So this is also something that gets highly dependent on the actual task domain and this mm. is something that is still yeah you can also embed into the in the unit configuration right uh that's very easy to embed uh, there's just one thing uh, one should keep in mind and that is that maybe you will want to change the learning rate as well if you're changing the loss function because for some loss functions you might need different learning rates um, but since the learning rate is part of the fixed parameters that's just something you can change and then try out and, and pick whatever works best so there's no long tail of hyperparameter optimization that would uh, result from that. How difficult would it be to work into or look into mixed precision and stuff that you can use the memory more efficiently? Or are you already using that? Uh, and then UNET always uses mixed precision training. It, uh, you need to explicitly ask it for uh, standard FP32 training if that's what you want. So that's uh, something that is I would say urgently, uh, very much needed, especially when working with 3D convolutions, because the speed difference is even more important than the memory difference. Uh, I think that's 2.5x or 3x speed difference in uh, mixed precision versus FP32. Um, one side note, unfortunately, currently in PyTorch, if you inst install PyTorch with PIP or Conda, it's, uh, the mixed precision acceleration is broken. Um, and it's not going to give you any speed up. So you need at the moment, unfortunately, to compile PyTorch yourself uh, to get the full speed up. We have a list in the, the NNUNet repository is a list of expected epoch times. Um, and you should be benchmarking uh, following the instructions there to make sure that your NNUNet is performing as it should, because otherwise trainings are taking very long. Thanks, that's a very good hint. So now we've seen all the medical applications. Which non-medical applications are you aware of that NNU net is being used on? Um, I'm I'm not very much aware of what exactly people are doing with NNU net. I just know that you can, of course, use it for other applications as well. Uh, if you compare it on, say, cityscapes, etc., I wouldn't expect it to give you state-of-the-art performance because on this data set, it's um, maybe a good idea to use pre-trained encoders that you pre-trained on ImageNet or something like that. But I see in the comments that somebody has uh, applied it to uh, satellite data and that it's been working very nicely for them. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And uh, if you're willing to, I'd actually love to, to get in contact and learn more about it because non-medical applications of NNUNet are actually something I'm very interested in as well. Yeah, it's very cool if you are not working on a standard problem like for autonomous driving and road scene segmentation, then you have to adopt all the parameters and there you run very quickly into exactly the same problems as you have in medical, that you have very different requirements depending on the data set. So, uh, do you have uh, some tips or some hints? When you look into the literature, there's sometimes uh, a lot of like unit-like results and they have... Um, yeah, the, the, sometimes they all work with the same data set and then the data set is also quite small and you see that the papers progress, they do these small changes on, on modifications, but then at some point it becomes really difficult to reproduce them and we, we actually just found in a paper for retinal vessel segmentation that we could not reproduce some of the results that were reported in on overview papers. So some of the top results we could not reproduce. And then it turned out that um, it essentially um, might be related to overfitting. So, Yeah, I think interpreting segmentation papers currently is very difficult because so many people are working on it and everybody wants to get their method out. So there's a lot of overstatement of what things actually do. Um, so when I get 
shown a segmentation paper or some colleague points me out some paper and, and asks me for feedback, the first thing I actually do is look at the evaluation. And then I'm, I'm really looking at, do these people use standardized data sets? Do these people report test set results? So really submit to a leaderboard and report test set results there. And if they are not using like test set results and competitions, I'm always looking for um, um, comparisons with state-of-the-art methods that I know of. So in my case, I often look for something that is related to NNUNet. We have applied it to many data sets. So that's naturally for me something I'll be looking at. Um, and I will also be looking at uh, how many different data sets and how, how diverse are the data sets that the method is being applied to. So if I'm making a general claim like, hey, this loss function is better than the dice loss, then I need to show this on many data sets. And if I'm using just one data set or I'm using two abdominal CT data sets, which are essentially the same thing, then uh, that's something that will get me, uh, get me skeptical. Yeah, so evaluation is key and I would only focus on, on papers where the evaluation passes several sanity checks and only then uh, really start looking into them. Yeah, in that particular case, it was even a public data set with a dedicated uh, training and test split. But it seems that they optimize so much that they essentially optimize for the random seed. Um, well, if they, that's, that's another thing that's potentially dangerous. Like I'm always telling people never seed your experiments because you're hiding all the variation that is just inherent in, in, your, in your data. I never seed my experiments and a unit is never seeded. You can tell it to use a seed, but I think it's super dangerous to do it. It's only something you should do if you're writing up a paper and then you want to have something that you can share and people can actually reproduce. Um, so, and yes, overfitting is a huge problem. And that is again, something where I see methods like uh, in a new net having a certain advantage because we are not optimizing all our hyperparameters to one particular data set, but we need to somehow find something that somehow works with so many different data sets that it becomes very difficult to, to overfit and to find like a particular setting that would then be impossible to reproduce. I completely agree with that. Fabian, thank you very much for your time here and for the presentation. I think it was wonderful and I think you deserve another round of applause. Thank you very much. It was great being here and, and uh, presenting to you and I'm looking forward to meeting more people from your lab. Yeah, Fabian, thank you very much for this brilliant presentation. You see that we had quite a bit of discussion and that all of the software that he's presenting is actually available as open source software. So if you think that NNUNet might be something that you also want to apply, maybe also in other domains than medical image segmentation, then please go ahead and download his software. And of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We'd be glad to answer them either directly in the comments under this video, or you can also send them to us by email, social media, whatever you like. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. And I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you again in the next episode of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>